Hey, it's Norm from Tested.com. I'm here in New York City this week in a really cool place. This is Holographic Studios. And Jason Sapan, you're the founder of the run, you run Holographic Studios, which yes. is a lab here that's been operating for almost 40 years. Yes. So you are the person to talk to when it comes to making holograms from start to finish. So I want to educate you guys. I want to learn about the holographic process. So what is a hologram? Well, a hologram is a photograph of the shape that light takes when it's impressed by an object. So think of a piece of clay. Imagine if a light wave were a wave of clay instead of a wave of light, and that clay came up to an object, took its shape, and went back with the shape of the object in it to our film. So they're talking about depth information. There is three-dimensional, complete containment information on a side of the object. We're not seeing the back side of it, mm -hmm. but everything that the eye, that the light could shine on is captured here with information about its phase, how close and how far it is as it returns back to the film over time. And we're using a trick called interference to capture it because, you know, in a camera, if you're moving like this for a selfie, It'll blur because yeah. there's too much movement, but that's like five, 10 miles an hour. Light travels at the speed of light. Yes. So, you know, if it's going to blur at 10 miles an hour, you know, 186,000 miles a second is going to be a challenge. So we need a way to get past that. And interference is the answer in that if we have a wave of light that has captured the shape of something meeting just another wave of light, the misregistration from perfect to shaped is captured as a pattern of light waves. So the light waves are still in motion, but the shell of the wave is now standing. And that shell is what you're capturing. And we're photographing that, right. So that's a pattern of light waves. So like when a high point of a light wave, think about the ocean. You know, if you threw in two rocks into the ocean, you'd have circular waves and the waves as they meet, they would interfere with each yep. other, right? So two high points would add, two low points would drop down, a high point and a low point would cancel. Light's doing the exact same thing. So we'll get areas of darkness where the waves have just canceled each other, areas where it's a little bit brighter, and it becomes a wave pattern. That That's would, what creates that look. That is the look of the hologram itself. So inside the film, Remember, a light wave measures maybe half of a micron. A micron's a millionth of a meter. So we're talking nanometer sizes. Mm -hmm. And the film is 10 microns. It's 20 times bigger. So there's more than enough room in the thickness of what mm. we call flat film to accommodate this capture of the three-dimensional shape. I think that's a big jump for people because yes. you're using film. It's still, you know, traditional analog film. Yes, it is. But because the film has a thickness, that's where the information is stored. It's not that the, the information is somehow, you know, you're at the layers of film. No, there's no layer whatsoever. It's oh. a single thing. Even if we were to shoot it digitally, mm -hmm. it's still a pattern of information of light waves canceling and building, creating a imprint physically, you know, in the dimensionality of the thickness of the film. Wow. And think of it like a casting, like a jello mold. Yeah, if yeah. you were to pour a tire print, okay? We're at a crime scene and some, you know, investigators are now looking in the ground mm -hmm. and there's tracks of a tire. So what do they do? They pour plaster mm -hmm. into the track, wait till it's hard, they pull it out, and here's a sculptural three-dimensional image of the tire. A hologram is a sculptural casting of the light waves. Within just a special piece of film, but... It's a high resolution and film. And that film... But it's it actually black and white film. What is color? Color is, you know, you always hear people, it's like wavelength, frequency. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wavelength, the length of the wave. So let's, let's go to another kind of wave that's more familiar, a harp, okay? Bong, 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 okay. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. So the waves of light in a rainbow are literally like the notes in a harp. You know, so as we get to our long wavelengths, that's redder. And you know this like from the galaxy, mm -hmm. the red shift and everything, sure. that the waves are getting longer. So here now, 
in a hologram, let's say we take our red laser and we record an image into our film. When we develop the film, depending on which chemistry we use, let's say the film shrinks a little bit. So it's gone from red to green. Mm, and that's and that color. can affect color. Ah. So, you know, the light coming in is going to fit into the size wavelength that the casting was made of. So oh, okay. we, we can play with colors in ways that, you know, we're not dealing with, you know, your typical pigments or fluorescing phosphors. Here we're taking captured white light and we are now expressing it, you know, in a dimensional way using the size of the wavelength. And, you know, we can intentionally swell it up, shrink it down. And That's a really cool way to think about it, the dimensionality and the, phys uh, the physical process is how, and how you adjust those parameters is how you change the look of a hologram. Exactly. So uh, we've seen holograms. You have a ton of holograms here in your gallery that you shot over the years. A lot of them uh, are not just static images, are holograms of shifting images, either yes. like a face when you pan across a face or even a transition. How do you get multiple frames uh, into That's a, a great thing. We're doing one right now uh, for a young couple, and in it they're doing like a fist bump of mm -hmm. action. And how do you get motion? Well, whether you're dealing with a flip book of animation or an old 16 millimeter movie or a video file, you get animation always the same way. If you're putting together an animated GIF, you take a bunch of frames and you have them succeed one after another. And it is the continuation because at a twelfth of a second, our eyes, rather than seeing separate images, connects them and this is how all animation works. Yeah, it's a zoetrope. Your, your brain does the work. Our brain is the animator. Yep. So we're just doing the exact same thing but in a new medium. So we're putting together a bunch of holographic exposures and once again there are many ways to skin a cat. We can, one of the ways that we're doing is we can compress it, you know, and do a series of anamorphically compressed stripes shot mm -hmm. onto the mm -hmm. film. And we can overlap okay. it. We can, you know, a lot of things, our, you know, optics in our body, you know, sort of take care of a lot of the physics so we don't have to work as hard as we would like to because we want to really abuse ourselves. So you've captured, for example, like 24 frames, one second of animation. That would be one action. second, right. Um, and then in the final product, is that film then how does that film get processed so you can see the animation as you're walking across Well, we it? would shoot a number of frames. Now, we can't just work with 24 frames because what's happening is your eyes are going to look across, you know, our left eye versus our right eye, mm -hmm. and you're going to see sort of a field of overlapped images. And our eyes are going to see maybe as many as 60 of them all at the same time. So here's the dilemma. If we're seeing 60 frames, and like you're saying, 24 frames would be one second mm -hmm. of elapsed cinema time, we're seeing two and a half seconds of time in an instant, not a second. So when we're shooting, we have to sort of think ahead to the next step, not what we're actually seeing in camera, but what will happen when all of these now get put back together as a single frame. and we want to avoid, let's say if your hand was here in frame one and your hand is here in frame 60 and your brain gets all of this information simultaneously, it doesn't it's going to smear it. Yeah. Right. So when we shoot it, we have to think about, well, the angle of rotation. Our eyes are left and right and that horizontal plane works in our favor. So horizontal movement we can do better than, say, vertical movement. Mm. So we cheat things to do what the medium wants to do. And then in creating that, in shooting that, you've built your own equipment. Oh, everything. Yeah, downstairs, what used to be this an old workshop here. Well, know. you know, it's interesting. You know, a century ago, this actual building was a blacksmith's forge. Mm -hmm. So there was a practitioner, not very different than myself in his era, creating things, you know, taking a piece of metal, making it glow red to give it shape, right? And I'm using the laser, the image is, you know, created with a red glowing shaped image. So maybe I'm not so unique. Um, I'm just doing a, a newer technique. I'm an updated blacksmith, you know. You're so working with I'm light. A, I'm a color smith. Okay. So, um, 
What I'm doing is I'm taking a lot of found equipment and we are now using this to solve our little maze. How do we get from here with you know, our original image content to there where it becomes a hologram? So the components that you'll see downstairs are in the laboratory, an old optical printer, which is like a movie projector where we're gonna shoot one frame of film at a time. We've cannibalized the light source and replaced it with laser light goes through our frame of film, it projects out, but in the projection, you don't really think about it in regular life, but you know when something is projecting, the image is getting larger. It's getting larger because it's going through a lens. The lens makes things larger because of its curvature. So it has that round bowl shape, mm -hmm, which means mm -hmm. the light coming out of it as it gets larger is also bowl shaped. So in the hologram, unlike on a flat screen where dimension does matter, the image would distort. Right. It would follow that bowl. So, so you correct for that. We have to correct for that. So we need a very big lens that corrects for that. So we're creating a Galilean telescope, a small lens and a big lens, negative and positive. So now the light is straight. And the waves then go out, and then we've created what's called an anamorphic lens. Now, anamorphic lens dates back to the old days in cinematography, where the frames of film in the movie were square, but the screens were rectangles, and the way they would correct for that analog would be a lens that would squish it up and then stretch it out. So in our case, we want to squeeze them up, so we're going to make each exposure a compression, which is like a little thin vertical line, and then we shoot a series of them to get a moving hologram. We don't do this in a regular hologram. Right. And then we need a step motor to advance that film itself that we then stick on there, the raw film, uh, on a cylinder so it maintains the rotation like when we actually shot it on a turntable. Wow, it's a very elaborate process that you've spent decades iterating on. Trying to learn it. And still learning it. We're all Trying. still learning. And you photograph so many interesting people. If people want to come here to New York to Holographic Studios and get their portrait taken you know, or tour your studio, can they do that? Oh, absolutely. We organize tours all the time. You know, if you go to our website, holographer.com, you know, just click on the tours section. You can learn about our group tours, our individual tours. That's awesome. Holograms, small and big. Small really and big. Really big. Yes. And I love that you can come here and take an internship and learn how yes. to make a hologram. I hope that we got just a little bit of that in this video today. Thank you so much, Jason. Oh, thank you. For teaching me a little bit Appreciate of holograms this. while I'm in New York. We'll have more stuff untested. Subscribe to our channel down there. I'm Norm. I'll see you next time.